Hey, sports history fans, this is Ariel Gonzalez from Wrestling With Heels On. Hey, when you go to a sporting event, you don't go there to be meek and mild unless you live in Japan. You go there to get freaking wild. That means bringing some attitude to your amplitude. How do you do that? You get racket. R-A-K-I-T. Racket combines a compact 7-inch megaphone, eight powerful adjustable LED lights, noisemakers, an insert you design, and it's all fully customizable to match your team's colors. Now, here's the coolest thing about this product. J.J. Abraham, the founder, was the ultimate cheer dad. He followed his daughter's cheer group around the country, and he saw parents struggling using all sorts of crazy contraptions to make some noise for their kids. And then he had an aha moment. He thought, wait, why not combine all of these doodads into an all-in-one compact device for the ultimate fan? J.J. and his team were three years on developing version after version after version until they finally landed on Racket, R-A-K-I-T, so you can make some noise and cheer and be a part of the action. So get out there and let's get loud. Bring a Racket to your next game or competition to cheer on your favorite team or athlete. You can customize your Racket with your own logos, drawings, and names. Get beads to match your team's colors. Flashing lights add to the excitement. Are you ready to make a racket? Be part of the game. Each racket pack comes with one racket megaphone, one lanyard to keep a hold of the thing, two scratch-resistant bead packs, one clear and one color of your choice, and a 10-pack of customizable self-adhesive inserts. Currently on sale, wait for it, $24.99. To pick up your racket today, head to MyRacket.com. That's my r a k i t dot com. Now get out there and make some noise. Is us? This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Hello sports fans and welcome to another edition of Yesterday's Sports on the Sports History Network. Today we're going to continue our discussion on the top quarterbacks of the 1970s. At number 10 we have Archie Manning who played for the New Orleans Saints from 1971 to 1979 Going by statistics alone, you could argue that Manning should not be ranked this high. But let's face it, the guy had great talent and never had the opportunity to play for a good team. In his 14 seasons in the NFL, he played for 11 different coaches and never played on a winning team. Despite this, Archie had some excellent seasons. In 1972, he led the league in completions and led the NFC in passing yards. He threw for well over 3,000 yards in both 1978 and 1979 and played in the Pro Bowl in both of those seasons. Manning was also a running threat, gaining 2,197 rushing yards in his career for a 5.7 yards per carry average. At number 9 we have Billy Kilmer who played for the New Orleans Saints and the Washington Redskins from 1970 to 1978. Kilmer, who was almost killed in a car accident in 1962, didn't have much success in the 1960s. He was traded to the Redskins in 1971 to fill the role of backup to future Hall of Famer Sonny Jurgensen. But he took over as the starter when an aging jerky caught the injury bug. While his statistics were average at best, Kilmer led the Redskins to their first postseason appearance since 1945. In 1972, he had the best season of his career, finishing with an 84.8 passer rating and leading the league in touchdown throws. 
Kilmer led Washington to the Super Bowl and played in the only Pro Bowl of his career. While Kilmer's stats were never overly impressive, he did have three seasons in a row of an over 80 passer rating, and one can't underestimate his leadership and toughness. His teammates rallied around him, and he led the Redskins to the postseason five times in his eight seasons with the team. His overall record as a starter for the Redskins was 52 wins and 28 losses. At number eight, we have Jim Hart, who played for the St. Louis Cardinals from 1970 to 1979. It wasn't until his eighth season in the league that Hart became one of the league's top quarterbacks. Much like Billy Kilmer, Hart's statistics were never overly impressive. He threw way more interceptions than touchdown passes. His best season was in 1974 when he was named All-Pro and led the Cardinals to their first postseason appearance since 1948. They made the playoffs again in 1975 and 1976, and Hart made the Pro Bowl in both seasons and again in 1977. Hart passed for 23,000 and 26 yards during the 1970s, and that is second only to Fran Tarkington. At number seven, we have Burt Jones, who played for the Baltimore Colts from 1973 to 1979. One could argue that from 1975 to 1977, Jones was one of the top three quarterbacks in the league. In 1975, he had an impressive 89.1 passer rating and led the Colts to their first playoff appearance since 1971. The following year, Jones led the league in passing yardage and again led the Colts to the playoffs. On the season, he threw 24 touchdowns, only 9 interceptions, and had a passer rating of 102.5. For his efforts, he was named the 1976 NFL MVP. His success continued in 1977 as he led the league in completions, led the Colts to the playoffs again, and was named All-Pro. Unfortunately, Jones suffered a shoulder injury in 1978, and although he occasionally showed flashes of his former self, he never fully recovered from the injury and retired after the 1982 season. At number six, we have Kenny Anderson from the Cincinnati Bengals, played from 1971 to 1979. Anderson became the Bengals' starting quarterback in 1972 and quickly established himself as one of the top quarterbacks in the league. He led Cincinnati to the playoffs in 1973 with an 81.3 passer rating. In 1974, Anderson led the league in completions, completion percentage, passing yardage, and passer rating. The following season, he again led his team to the playoffs, led the league in passing yardage and passer rating, and was named All-Pro. His 1976 season, while not quite as impressive as 1974 and 1975, was good enough to earn him a trip to the Pro Bowl. After a so-so season in 1977 and a not-so-good season in 1978, Anderson came back strong in 1979 with an 80.7 passer rating. He had more success in the early 1980s, leading the Bengals to a Super Bowl and winning an NFL MVP award. But the 80s is not the 70s, so it doesn't count. Sorry, Kenny. At number five, we have Ken Stabler, played for the Oakland Raiders for the entire decade of the 1970s. Stabler got very little playing time in his first three seasons, 
but finally got his chance to be the starter in 1973. He responded by leading the league with a 62.7 completion percentage and playing in the Pro Bowl. In 1974, he led the league in touchdown throws and finished the season with a 94.9 passer rating. For his efforts, he was voted NFL MVP. After a not-so-good season in 1975, Stabler returned with a vengeance in 1976. He led the league with a 66.7 completion percentage, touchdowns with 27, and a passer rating of 103.4. Kenny played in his third Pro Bowl, placed third in MVP voting, and most importantly, led the Raiders to their first Super Bowl title. Although he couldn't match what he did in 1976, 1977 was another Pro Bowl season for Stabler. 1978 was a disappointing season for Stabler and the Raiders, but he rebounded in 1979 and even received some MVP votes. Despite the good season, the Raiders traded Stabler to the Houston Oilers during the offseason. Well, that concludes our podcast for today. Join me again next week when we will go through number four, three, two, and finally the number one quarterback of the 1970s. Hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. God bless. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network Back in 2020, with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.